In early August of 1917, while the war raged in Europe, Third Assistant Secretary Breckinridge Long sends a memorandum to Secretary of State Robert Lansing in Washington, calling for a, quote, Bureau to be established for the study and preparation of those questions which appear likely to be proposed at the Peace Conference, end quote. The memo came on the recommendation of Frank Lyon Polk and Felix Frankfurter in France since early July, and inspired by similar British and French foreign diplomatic efforts already underway. The memo was a call for America to begin preparations for peace talks, some 15 months prior to the signing of the armistice. By October, an ad hoc organization was discreetly working parallel to the Wilson administration in Upper Manhattan. A group known as the Inquiry, directed by Wilson's key advisor, Colonel Edward Mandel House, while leading progressives, Louis Brandeis, and the founders of the New Republic magazine, Walter Weil, Herbert Crowley, Felix Frankfurter, and Walter Lippmann, all had significant influence. Wilson, whose re-election less than a year earlier was largely built on the campaign slogan, quote, he kept us out of war, end quote, was now planning for peace. Besides House and Lippmann, the inquiry's inner circle consisted of four others. Columbia history professor James T. Shotwell, international law expert David Hunter Miller, Harvard law grad Archibald Carey Coolidge, and House's brother-in-law, Sidney Mezes. It quickly became apparent that with the, quote, vast field that would be covered by the peace conference, end quote, the small rooms reserved for their work in the New York Public Library would be insufficient. It was the first task of Shotwell's to gain the, quote, cooperation of university men drawn from the highest academic capacity in the country, end quote. And it was agreed upon by the early founders to, quote, enlarge the organization by adding colleagues in the various political and social sciences, end quote. The personnel for this strange experiment came almost exclusively from Yale, Columbia, and Harvard, three of America's most prestigious Ivy League universities. Early recruits were Charles Homer Haskins, George Lewis Beer, Charles Seymour, and in November, the inquiry found their chief territorial specialist and executive officer in Isaiah Bowman. Bowman, as the director of the American Geographical Society, had at his disposal some of the best map-making equipment in the entire United States. A graduate of Harvard in 1905 and Yale in 1909, Bowman had already led three South American expeditions for the Yale Corporation, making worldwide headlines in 1911 rediscovering Machu Picchu with Hiram Bingham. Bowman also created the Geographical Review in 1915 and remains today as one of the three pioneers of American geography. He was a founding member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Board of Director until his death in 1950. With Bowman aboard, the inquiry had found their leader in the American Geographical Society building at 3755 Broadway for the next 13 months would be the inquiry's top secret headquarters. This chosen location convenient in that Shotwell at Columbia, Mezes at the City College of New York, and Bowman at the AGS were all within four subway stops of each other on the Broadway line in Upper Manhattan. The inquiry, as it was officially known, was purposely ambiguous in title, helping to ensure their work, quote, 
would be perfectly blind to the general public, but which nevertheless would serve to identify it among the initiated." End quote. The name was, quote, adopted at first only provisionally, end quote, at Shotwell's suggestion, but, quote, later retained by the paradox that its very inadequacy was its best recommendation, end quote. The inquiry's membership would eventually grow to include over 150 academics, and by early December of 1918, their 13-month-long effort culminated when the inquiry's division chiefs accompanied the president aboard the USS George Washington as his personal advisors, a front row seat on Wilson's historic trip to the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. The reports created in the year-long period prior to the peace talks, along with the hundreds of carefully hand-drawn maps, diagrams, and graphs, proved invaluable at the meetings in Paris. And this marks a historically significant moment in American history for, quote, never before had universities been mobilized for such a service, end quote. Never before had a private group of scholars been appointed as direct advisors to a U.S. president, and never before had a sitting American president relied so heavily upon such a group. And this would cause friction within the State Department, especially with the Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, the DOS feeling that this new approach violated already established foreign policy protocol, shot well implying later that it may have even been illegal. Even before the armistice, there had been some indications, although none of them serious, that there were those in the State Department who were by no means happy at the way in which the preparations for the peace conference were being made. This was not only natural under the circumstances, but from a standpoint of public law, had apparent justification. In their eyes, it was one thing for the president to have a personal advisor in Colonel House, but quite a different thing for the colonel's staff to develop to the point of displacing the established governmental organ for foreign affairs. Of the 23 inquiry members to accompany Wilson to Paris, all were from the social or political sciences. Nearly all had a prestigious background in the classical arts, many graduating magna cum laude and along the way establishing fraternal connections that would guarantee long, distinguished international careers. The inquiry was hardly bipartisan, its membership largely made up of progressives and staunch advocates of an Anglo-American establishment and a future society ran by expert opinion rather than democratic tradition. The inquiry was essential in the creation of a society we see today whose consent is largely manufactured by experts far outside the realm of public accountability. In fact, the arrival of the inquiry signifies an incredibly important turning point in modern human history. For the first time, we see unelected men of private academic affairs with no responsibility to either the government organ that hired them or the people they serve, taking a central role in determining national borders around the world. All in a premeditated, coordinated, some might even say conspiratorial effort to reorient the world more towards an international order of law, or as they say themselves openly, a new world order. The inquiry members essential in the creation of the UN the U.S. Foreign Office, and the U.S. Intelligence Community, the International Labor Organization, and two of the most prominent advocates of international cooperation, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. These men of the inquiry and their interlocking associations to Wall Street, military intelligence, mass media, Ivy League academia, and nonprofit research foundations like Russell Sage make them an interesting historical study to be sure, a study somehow mysteriously absent from the public record until now, a study we at the History of Propaganda look forward to documenting in future episodes as this strange experiment in social engineering has finally found its historian. <laughs>